This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Rob Storr received a BA from Swarthmore College in 1972, and an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1978. He, like other deans in this room, is a true Renaissance man. He is a superb artist, a distinguished critic, and a luminous writer. His thoughtful and beautifully considered essay on the Stewart Collection for our book landmarks in 2001 is a truly enlightened tour of the campus. In 2006, Rob was a, Robert Storr was appointed professor of, painting and, a professor of Painting and Dean of the School of Art at Yale University. He has been an important and guiding member of the Stewart Collection Advisory Board since 2004. Rob is also an important curator. When he curated the 2007 Venice Biennale, he was the first American to do so. He was curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art, New York, from, two, from 1990 to 2002. He is a teacher. In 2002, Mr. Storr was named the first Rosalie Sola Professor of Modern Art at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. He has taught at CUNY, the Bard Center for Curatorial Studies, Rhode Island School of Design, Tyler School of Art, New York Studio School, and Harvard University. He lectures frequently in this country and abroad. Rob has been a contributing editor at Art in America since 1981 and writes frequently for Art Forum, Parquet, Art Press Paris, and Freeze London. He has also written numerous catalogs, articles, and books. Among the many honors he has received are a Penny McCall Foundation grant for painting, a Norton Family Foundation curator grant, and honorary doctorates from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the Maine College of Art, and Lyme Academy. His awards include the American Chapter of International Association of Art Critics, a special AICA award for distinguished contribution to the field of art criticism, an ICI Agnes Gundon Curatorial Award, and the Lawrence A. Fleischman Award for Scholarly Excellence in the Field of American Art History from the Smithsonian Institution's Archives of American Art. In 2000, the French Ministry of Culture presented him with the Medal of Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres. He is currently consulting curator of the modern and contemporary art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Mighty impressive. Please welcome our good friend, Rob Storr. We have had any number of controversies about public art in this country. Uh, they go very far back, uh, certainly in the history of 20th century American art. Uh, the beginning of many of these controversies would be something like the WPA, when large amounts of federal money were poured into uh, the making of public murals and post offices and government buildings and so on, and where the possible sexual innuendos of an, a breech cloth on a Native American in a painting by Paul Cadmus uh, nearly brought the house down. That was in the 1930s. Um, this keeps happening over and over and over again. In the 1980s, there were the so-called culture wars in this country, and certainly the uh, situation of public art, or at least works made for public uh, 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 display, uh, were the places where things got the most heated. Um, that's the sort of um, the, 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 the fireworks and um, um, hell and brimstone side of things, and I don't want to linger on it too long, but it does bring to the fore some of the misconceptions about public art, or at least some of the problems that any kind of public art, no matter how controversial or non-controversial it is intrinsically, is, uh, arises. In the popular mind, public art is a relatively simple proposition. It means something like an object and something like a special space. 
And many people begin with only that to work from, with no general sense of what the history of the medium is, the history of the social context is, and try to do their best. So uh, two weeks ago, I was at Delta State University, which is a small state university in the Mississippi Delta, and was asked to please speak to some people there who were interested in and have already begun the process of creating a public space for sculpture at Delta State University. Now, imagine that this is this amazingly beautiful flat landscape. Uh, it's a state university with some resources, not an enormous resource, and of course, all state universities are strapped. Uh, so of course, the initiative, rather like here, is a matter of public-private collaboration. Uh, the way to do this will be that the people from the town will fund it, and that it will take place in the middle of a state university. And I was shown the layout that they had de designed, and it was a wonderful sort of serpentine walkway with some uh, low-rise uh, barrier walls. And then uh, in each one of the curls of the walkway, there were plinths that had been poured already in concrete, and they were of differing sizes. And I was asked the question, well, what do you think you can do with this proposition? Uh, what can we do with this proposition to create a contest whereby every year we will change the work on display in this situation and uh, we will advertise that we have this and we will talk to artists about whether they would like the three foot diameter print or the six foot diameter print. Now I say this uh, because it is a perfectly innocent and understandable misconception uh, because the idea behind it is one that many people have. Public art basically is a statue and I'll get my first image now. Here's a statue. Uh, and since I'm talking about Delta State University, I just want to be fair. This is Yale University, and they have this problem too. Um, so uh, this is the statue of Nathan Hale. Variations of it are to be found everywhere. Uh, he is one of the great figures in the history of Yale. Uh, but this is the conservative definition of public art uh, that in a sense comes to mind in many minds, sophisticated and less so, uh, when the words come up. This is a statue in a public space, usually uh, in some kind of uh, presentation space, some kind of nearly sacred space. Um, alternatively, or not alternatively, but in addition, is the idea that there is the plaza, which is a certain public space, or there is the garden. Now, the history of gardens and plazas, one could go into a long time, and I'm not going to do art history here, but consider that a, a plaza is something in the midst of the city, and that a garden is something that is, if you will, set aside from the city. It is nature encapsulated. It can be a great garden or park, uh, like in Olmsted Park in Chicago or uh, in many other places in this country, um, including New York uh, twice in Brooklyn and in Central Park, or it can be something else. But the idea of a set-aside environment uh, for nature and sometimes under those circumstances a set-aside environment in which art is then placed um, is one of the ideas that people have, and this is the idea in Delta State, and the way in which the campus of Yale is used more or less. The quadrangles are sort of gardens, uh, and the sculpture is distributed among them. We've had a running conversation recently about where to put uh, a wonderful Max Ernst uh, sculpture, which is indeed a statue of Habakkuk. Uh, and it's been an interesting discussion because Habakkuk, of course, uh, is uh, decrying the downfall of everything. And at the point where things looked really pretty dire some years ago in this country, people were thinking, where do we put Habakkuk so that he can proclaim uh, the end of the world as they uh, saw it coming? Um, in any case, um, I'm just, again, trying to stir the pot a little bit. Um, but in any case, the idea of a garden or a public plaza and a statue is pretty much what traditional ideas of public art have been. And of course, uh, in the nature of the public uh, plaza, it is the celebration of power. In the nature of parks, it is uh, something that is the special delectation of those who have public parks or private parks or gardens. Um, in any case, the understanding is that a sculpture made in such a space is a celebration of civic values, of the values of a society, of the values of a culture. Much like history painting, traditional history painting was the celebration of the victories of Napoleon or of Washington crossing the Delaware or of uh, Montcalm dying on the uh, Plains of Abraham in Canada or any number of other things. That what you did in public was talk about public values, things that people shared or were assumed to share. And if they didn't, you made something in order that they be inculcated with these values. You persuaded them. And to that extent, the WPA was a massive exercise in creating public art of this nature. It was to redefine what being an American was at a time when this society was stretched and strained by every kind of economic, ideological, and political division. 
Now, if that is sort of the primary object, uh, the, uh, the assumption is that the, the placement and the choice of work uh, will in fact affirm something that everybody, again, can rally around. Um, of course, if they don't rally around it, you've got a big problem. Uh, because then you have something centrally located that they can all fight about, and you don't want that. So in the circumstances which are familiar, uh, one of the choices is therefore to put art that is non-controversial, uh, to choose things that will excite nobody, or at least not excite them to civil war. Now, I'm saying this, uh, and I don't mean to make fun at all of Henry Moore, I'm saying this because actually the sad thing about this way of looking at public art is to reduce very serious artists to the position of inoffensive. Um, and one of the problems that we have in public art is that there's a whole group of artists who become the candidates for inoffensiveness, even though their work is, in fact, uh, quite important. Uh, none other than Bruce Nauman, who is the author of one of the best pieces here in the Stewart Collection, made a famous piece called Henry Moore Bound to Fail. I don't have an image of it here, but basically it's a man in a sweater with it's Bruce with his arms tied behind him. And I, like many people, long thought this, this was a satire of Henry Moore by a, an up-and-coming artist who was working in new media and would have looked at monumental sculpture of this kind of uh, nature as being the conservative position. So I uh, had to humble myself when I was told by Bruce that in fact that's not at all what it was. He made this piece because in the time that he was coming up in the 1960s, people did in fact view uh, Henry Moore as the opposition, as the conservative position in sculpture, and that he actually felt some kind of empathy for Moore, who was bound to fail under those circumstances, even though it wasn't that his work itself was intrinsically worthless. But in any case, in the domain of public art, Henry Moore, and here's the next candidate, uh, one of the next candidates, David Smith, or here's the next candidate, Alexander Calder, this is Yale, um, become the artists who are placed in public situations, but who are in certain senses not really public artists. They make monumental things, they make big things, they make beautiful things, they make things about which one can have complicated thoughts, but that's not the reason they're there. The reason they're there is that one can put them there without bothering too many people. One can put them there and have something that has capital art, almost like a thought balloon the love the object, um, but in fact will not inspire people to uh, riot. Um, now, again, I'm trying to, to, to deal with some of the issues and I don't want to do them at the expense of the artist nor even of the goodwill of people who acquire these things, present these things, and so on, but it has to do with a dynamic which is more interesting that I'd like to point to. Um, here's another uh, Calder. Uh, it reminds me, and this is not in Chicago, but there's another one similar to it in Chicago. It reminds me of the famous uh, controversy around the installation of a work by uh, Pablo Picasso in Chicago. It was a work that was the shape of a woman's head cut out of Corten steel. It was huge. Um, and Chicago was rich in Picassos and rich in people who knew Picasso and rich in people who were willing to spend serious money on Picasso. And it had a mayor named Richard Daly who had nothing to do whatsoever with Picasso. And it's a case of where the installation of Picasso sculpture in a public plaza downtown became the lightning rod for every possible uh, uh, feeling, anti-modernist feeling that you can imagine, every kind of anti-art feeling that you can imagine. And all of these things stirred up in a way uh, that became very, very difficult. And this is in the period uh, in the early 60s before Chicago really blew up in 68. But it was one of those big controversies about public art and what's that stuff doing here. Um, those controversies nonetheless actually opened up a debate, a space of debate. And that space of debate actually became the lightning rod through which an enormous amount of energy was channeled in this exact area such that within a few years of daily harumphing about this thing, he was embracing it. And within a few years of him embracing it, suddenly there was public art all over the loop uh, by Calder, among others, a thing like this, and by Chagall, and many, many, many others. So the process of assimilation, of rejection, of rebellion against modern art is a necessary step in the process of bringing it into the public domain, and you almost need a Richard Day Daly sometimes uh, to make it really happen, because arguing with somebody like that is so much fun. Um, this is another example of public art, and I just, just kind of to rhyme it with Calder. Uh, this is a work by Louise Bourgeois, an artist whose work was inherently intimate for most of her life, and, and that is to say a very long life. She lived to 97 uh, and died just this past year, uh, actually 98, excuse me. Uh, and for many, many years, she made the most intimate kind of sculpture. 
And one of the interesting sort of developments in the latter part of his career was to take that stuff and do it on a scale and to do it in a context where this intimist art that she made that was sort of surrealist, sort of so, uh, psychological versions of process art and so on and so forth became in fact work in the public domain. And this is one, this is an enormous spider of hers in the Tuileries garden. Now, uh, you can hardly think of anything uh, less desirable maybe than a spider in your garden if the spider is of this scale. Um, I remember once seeing a Louise Bourgeois show in Delaware uh, where a group of these were installed and there was a soundtrack of theremin music and it felt like you were in a 1950s science fiction movie um, and although I disapprove of putting theme music in exhibitions it kind of nicely brought forward the the creepy crawly nature of these sculptures now Louise who I worked with for a long time had a very complicated uh, set of ambivalent relationships with her mother uh, and therefore all of these spiders are identified with her mother the loving mother but uh, here again, when the public hears that and when the public walks in among the legs of this loving mother, they begin to get the sort of uh, sardonic joke. Um, I'll give you just one other. Um, this is another spider. This is also in Tuileries Garden, same view. I mean, different view, the same piece. This is also in the Tuileries at the other end. This is a piece of Louise's called Loving Hands, or Helping Hands, excuse me, which is a series of casts of her own hand and that of her assistant, Jerry Gorovoy, just clutching each other like this. Now. Uh, I'm putting this in just to show you the, the, the ways in which uh, things shift meaning when they enter the public domain. Uh, Louise made a lot of work of this kind, which uh, was kind of uh, something that you, you had a sense of direct connection with, but always within a gallery context, always within a context, again, which was domestic, intimate, or something of the kind. Put this in a public space, and it changes altogether. And in this particular case, I had a hand in making sure, excuse me, the pun, but I had a, a part in seeing to it that these actually did get to France, and we negotiated an arrangement whereby these would be permanently sited at the far end of the Tuileries, uh, near, uh, near the Place de la Concorde. And these things sit on plinths. Unfortunately, the photographs we were able to find are not very good, but they sit on rough stone plinths, and there's a group of about seven of them, including a child's hand at one point. And what's interesting is that they're low, they're not statues, uh, they're not complete figures. Um, they have no message. Um, they do nothing that uh, uh, sort of reaches out uh, in any kind of rhetorical way, and yet in every other way, they quite literally reach out to the public. And what happens is people drift into the garden, look at various things, and then they begin to touch these hands, and they begin to deal with them physically, directly, uh, phenomenologically, tactically, visually, every way you can think of. Uh, they directly address these hands, and so a private moment, which is the essentially uh, digital embrace of two figures, then becomes a public social moment when others enter into this equation. This is one nice picture because you can see water catching inside the hand. Now, here's another figure who's become a kind of plop art specialist through no fault of his own. In fact, he's one of the really extraordinary public artists. But this kind of piece, which is wonderfully uh, funny and whimsical, uh, which is a collaboration between uh, Klaus Oldenburg and his late wife, Kusha van Bruggen, is an example of the kind of work that people tend to think of now as a safe alternative to that which is controversial, that which is debatable. Uh, it's a reminder, though, that this is one of the first pieces of public art that Klaus made. Uh, he was a graduate of the Yale School of Art, and I mention this not out of um, patriotism right here, but uh, so I know I'm on another campus. But, <laughs> but this piece, which was made during the Vietnam War and which had an erectile um, dimension to it, was a kind of a, a, a inflatable uh, piece of lipstick at the top that would go up and down uh, and is on a half track, was seen as an anti-war memorial at the time and was highly controversial when it was displayed in the first instance. So even though he was an alumni, even though this was the 60s, the counterculture, and so on and so forth, this was a very debatable piece. And Oldenburg has had many other proposals that have also stirred controversy, although he has now been kind of grandfathered into the zone of people who, along with um, uh, 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 Henry Moore, uh, Calder, and others, can be done almost without a, a fuss. But here is the fuss. This, of course, is the famous Tilted Art by Richard Serra, uh, done on the Federal Plaza on downtown Manhattan. This is one view of it, and this is another. 
Now, this is a work of art similar to a great many pieces by Sarah that were put on private property and created no fuss whatsoever. There are even a number of these that were put on public property, but depends on where the public property is. For example, there's a beautiful piece called Clara Clara, which is made according to the roughly the same principles, which used to be cited on a couple of occasions in the space at the end of the Tuileries Garden, just near where Louise's hands are, uh, as you enter the garden, and it created no controversies whatsoever. But in this particular instance, this piece, commissioned by the, uh, the uh, GSA, the government Sur uh, General Services Administration of the government, uh, paid for by taxpayer money, and presented in a, courtyard, in a courtyard in front of a public building in downtown Manhattan, created a fear of the likes of which we have not seen, and I hope we'll never see again, uh, before this or since. Uh, and this particular piece was accused of everything under the sun, of being, and this was long before uh, we had the kind of troubles we now had, as being a possible site for terrorists, uh, as a place where muggers would hide, uh, as a place which will be graffitied by street kids. Well, it actually was. Um, but in any case, this was viewed in every possible way as the worst thing that could happen to an urban environment, as a result of which a process of decision making, which was done by peer review panels, uh, which was done according to all of the rules of government, of an elective government in our country, uh, was undone by a sort of kangaroo court plebiscite uh, organized inside a public bureaucracy. Here's another counterexample, and this, of course, is Maya Lin's uh, famous Vietnam War Memorial, which was done in Washington. It was the first project of a very young architectural student at Yale, uh, and it was something that was clearly informed by Richard Serra's work. But in this case, it was also about the most controversial war we had had up until that time. And this is an instance where a very simple abstract idea done with, again, federal government money, uh, stirred up a controversy and where the actual public participation with the piece actually won the day for the piece and created an environment in which all of the differences among the people who were likely to come, those who had lost members of their family and were for the war, those who had lost members of the family and were against the war, those who had uh, never fought the war, conscientious objectors who nonetheless uh, understood the tragedy of the war, all kinds of people came to this place and the gravity of the, of the, of the site, uh, the uh, effect of the list of names, the fact that there was no uh, sort of heroic uh, incarnation of soldiers, but the literal listing of uh, soldiers who had actually died, uh, created a memorial which actually worked as a memorial. But there were protests, and the protests precipitated the creation of this. This is a, a, a figurative sculpture by an artist named Hart, I've forgotten his first name, which was, what? Rick, okay. Which was cited, as you can see, just across from the memorial that was done by Maya Lin. And I think you can also see that the memorial by Maya Lin, if this is photograph is any indication, generally speaking, is the one to which people gravitate. Now, there is no harm in the Harp sculpture, frankly. Uh, it's not my idea of, uh, you know, a good sculpture. Um, but I think there's no harm in making such a memorial for those people who feel the need of it. And I don't think there's an inherent wrong in making figurative sculpture now, uh, although it is certainly not avant-garde. But what's interesting is how this compromise actually often works opposite to what you think it does. It doesn't create an alternative to which people automatically come. It points how it is that certain kinds of languages thought to be esoteric, thought to be uh, elitist, uh, are not. It speaks directly to people in a way that they understand before they understand the concepts or maybe as they understand the concepts. And so you have this uh, situation where a sculpture makes its own case. Here's another example. Now, segue to something of yours. Uh, this is uh, uh, Robert Irwin's piece, one of my favorite of all the Stewart collection. And I'm going to just show different images and try and talk about uh, some different issues in the same context. Um, the idea of making innocuous public art, so you celebrate the idea of art in some sort of categorical way without actually fostering the creation of art that is in itself uh, taken for its full value, or sometimes isn't a very good, a very high value, is the problem that public art has often. That the lack of commitment in uh, the public sector to an idea of public art means that people discount it in some fundamental way, either in thinking about what is done or in selecting what might be done. And uh, it is all to the credit of the Stewart Collection and to the UC San Diego, and for that matter, the whole California school system, that it has happened here 
It is also the credit of private patrons that it has happened here, because this is the one campus that I can think of where public art actually functions as art and as public art and is put in place in a way uh, that breaks the sort of paradigm that I was trying uh, to suggest was the paradigm of uh, much of what we see. In, it breaks it in a number of ways. Uh, it seems to me that the way in which this collection has developed, first of all, is intrinsically connected neither to the idea of the plaza nor the garden, much less is it a matter of statuary, although with Kiki Smith and others there actually are statues. Uh, it is an idea of some kind of a spatial matrix in which the experience of art is something that you enter into, sometimes knowing you're doing it, sometimes not knowing you're doing it, but that you always carry them off one piece into the vicinity of another piece. That you learn uh, from one exposure, one experience, from one encounter, sometimes one that you intend to the extent that you can see a piece at the distance and deliberately approach it. Other times, as in this uh, Irwin piece, where you simply sort of are there before you know it. Uh, that you have this experience of art and that each encounter uh, moves your understanding as well as physically, kinetically moves you along, each encounter moves your understanding through space and you no longer are in the outdoor gallery idea, which is what the Museum of Modern Art uh, was very proud of in the garden that Philip Johnson built, where you essentially create an external gallery with no ceiling, uh, but some walls. Uh, and it was more or less the white cube, except it was the uh, gray cube uh, and gray green cube. Uh, that's one model. It's a fine model for certain kinds of things, but this is a different model altogether. This is the space that one can move in any direction in, the one that one has purpose in. You go to a class, you go to a uh, a meeting, you do this or do that, and the experience of art is something that you have as you're doing that, and in certain circumstances you may linger, uh, and sometimes you may not have the choice of lingering, but in any case it is always there to be had, to be experienced, to be re-experienced, and in the simplest possible way, it allows people to, in a public situation, have the experience that people who own art have more readily. Um, I've been very privileged to uh, go to houses of people with truly great collections. I'll tell you a little anecdote. Um, one of them was Sally Gans, and Sally Gans and Victor Gans were two of the most remarkable collectors of modern art of the second half of the 20th century in the United States. Uh, they owned the greatest uh, Johnses, the greatest Stellas, uh, the greatest Rauschenbergs, and many, many, many Picassos. Um, and the first Picasso they bought was a painting called The Dream, which by now everybody knows, but when they bought it, everybody did not know it. Uh, they had previously bought a small watercolor by Jules Pasquin, and so the jump from a watercolor by Jules Pasquin to uh, the dream gives you an idea of what a remarkable boldness there was in their collecting. Um, and I knew Sally for many years. I knew Victor somewhat. I knew Sally for many, many years, and we'd go regularly. And if you went to their house, it was surrounded. You were surrounded by this art, and the, the experience of being there was that you could sit down in a chair and look one direction and see one thing. You could choose to sit in another chair in another occasion and see another thing in the other direction. And you kept organizing your visits in order to spend time looking at some things straight on and some things peripherally and to sort of soak them up and experience them. Uh, on one such occasion, uh, I was looking at the dream and noticed that there were two lamps in front of it. And uh, I said to Sally, why are there two lamps in front of this fantastic painting? Uh, and she said, first of all, it's my painting. <laughs> and then she said, and when I want to look at it, I move the lamps. But this is my house, too, and there are times when I want the lamps. Now, it was a wonderful kind of down-to-earth, as she was, explanation of what it is like to live with art. Now, a situation like the Stewart Collection is something like that, but for anybody. There are the days when you want this and the days when you don't want this, being a specific work. There are days when you want to spend more time with this one and none at all with that one, and then it reverses. There are days when you want to approach this one from this side and that one from that side. But the point is that possession is not the criteria. Vicinity, proximity, access is the criteria, but it is part of lived daily experience. And you have an enormous amount of volition, of control, of choice about how you look. And maybe this particular piece uh, by Irwin is the one where that is, at least in my experience, the most true, because there's so many approaches, there's so many ways in which it integrates with the environment, there's so many ways in which it appears and disappears according to where you actually stand. And here, for example, is the Terry Allen, where the sculpture part of it is basically what was there already, plus some lead and some nails. Um, the art part of it is partly that concretization 
of the tree which existed but has now been estranged, but mostly it is the sound or lack thereof, uh, the music or words that are part of it. And these things, again, are something you discover in your exposure to them, not things that jump out and grab you with uh, a, a, a kind of rhetorical meaning. This is not a statue. It is vertical. You could put it on a base of three foot square, roughly, but it is not that. It is in the environment, it is of the environment, and it is also at the same time the sort of stranger in the environment. And things like this, another kind of strangeness where you take something that is of everyday experience and relocate it in a context where it doesn't quite belong. Uh, also, in this case, of course, it's a wonderful play on time because as the students get younger and younger, so is my experience in any way, um, as students get younger and younger, this TV becomes more and more of an exotic kind of glacial erratic of the technological age. Um, and so it goes. Now, uh, the things I've shown you already obviate some of the uh, obvious sticking points. Sticking points are, for example, beauty versus ugliness. What is beautiful here and what is ugly, for example? Is the Buddha, which is done in a relatively simplistic, modeled fashion, beautiful or ugly? In general, we think of Buddhas as being um, you know, very beautiful. But this is a pretty rough Buddha. Maybe this is an ugly Buddha. But the TV, is the TV just junk? Or is it, in fact, an absolutely beautiful sculpture uh, made by uh, uh, somebody, a, de a designer of a certain period? And now, when people say to themselves, well, what is this about? Uh, the first thing is just primary aesthetic appeal. And the displacement or the relocation of primary aesthetic appeal or the debate between the two halves of it, where really does it lie? Is it in the ready-made TV, which is actually a spectacular uh, piece of form? Or is it in the Buddha, which is a spectacular idea in a relatively simplistic form? Where does it lie? In case of seriousness and whimsicality, where is the seriousness and whimsicality? People complain about public art because it's not serious enough some of the time, or else because it's serious about things that other people don't want to take seriously, or it's serious about things that other people do want to take seriously, but not from the angle that you propose. But in this particular case, what is serious and what is whimsical? Uh, what is it that um, is objectionable here because it doesn't live up to somebody's expectations? Well, you get caught, again, in this kind of ping-ponging back and forth of these two objects, uh, and that becomes the occasion for art. I like this one. This is the Buddha as viewed by the TV. <laughs> and here is sort of down and dirty Buddha. And this is the TV that has no TV. This is the void. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite things. This is where you take account of the landscape around you. This is Bill Wegman's piece. And so that you, uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful, um, you know, one of those things that you find at all great vistas and sites from the uh, Grand Canyon up to the Rockefeller Center. Uh, but this guide for what you're going to see, this map, and of course, already this map, she's got it right in front of her, here it is. Um, this map is out of date. Um, so already you have an historical dimension built into it. Now one of the things I want to say about the matrix idea of this collection and one of the ways in which it operates is that in fact it uh, deals with all kinds of issues in ways that are uh, specific to the site, but that site is an organically evolving site, or if it's not organically, it's inorganically evolving site. You have a site-specific nature to each one of these pieces, that is to say the choice of this work for that place. You have the integration of these sites. You have the ways in which they are sort of settled into the university as a whole. You have the interlocking of these sites in the sense that if you move from one to another, if you move from Alexis Smith, which we'll get to in a minute, and then look across and then there's Bruce Nauman, and if you look from Bruce Nauman and pretty soon you're gonna look at the Doho Sioux, if you move around in these cases, each one of these is an opportunity for contrast, for fresh experience, uh, and for rethinking. Here is Bruce's piece, which is I'm going to maybe linger on for a little longer. This is the actual text done in watercolor, which is his way of sketching out, and it's the seven virtues, seven vices, uh, juxtaposed. And this is how it appears around sundown, I think. Maybe this is dawn, but I think it's sundown. And here's a series of, now, as you know, these things flash on and flash off. So you get them bonded together, you get them separately, and then you get them, uh, if you will, sequentially. So back and forth. Now, here's, here's some of them put together. Now, but all of this, again, is within an evolving uh, environment, which is also a technological and architecturally evolving environment. The history of contemporary art is written in these works. And each one of them betrays or displays its own history in its own historical moment. 
to an increasingly apparent degree as time passes. So that, for example, uh, the Nam Jung Pai pieces deal with a technology which is already antique from the point of view of people who work with the kind of screens that you will find portrayed on John Baldessari's wall. Uh, and already the uh, TV, not TV monitor, but the uh, um, uh, computer monitor in John Baldessari's piece is an antique relative to what most of us carry in our valises, one kind or another. Now, I'm going to sort of run through these quickly, but just to take this as an example. If the traditional idea of public sculpture was that uh, public sculpture is to celebrate those things we have in common, or at least those things that the people in power wish to have us believe we have in common, uh, what of the things we do not have in common? What are the things that we do not agree on? What is the role of art about disagreement? And this is a very, very interesting and complex question in terms of uh, uh, contemporary art, since the very nature of contemporary art is that one should disagree about it. Uh, the uh, Lincoln Kirsten, the great ballet patron uh, and patron of many kinds of music, art critic, uh, bon vivant, uh, complex character if ever there was one, was the founder along with Philip Johnson and some other wealthy young men at Harvard of something called the Harvard Society for Contemporary Art, which was done in the 1920s. It was something done in advance of the creation of the Museum of Modern Art, and Alfred Barr, who was at that time, Alfred Barr, the founder of the Museum of Art, Modern Art, who was at that time a professor at Wellesley not far away, paid very close attention to what these young men did. And what they did within the first uh, few years of the existence of this society, a student group, basically, uh, showing the most advanced uh, art of its day, Mexican muralism, French painting, the Bauhaus, etc. Uh, they wrote a manifesto, and I think Lincoln was the author of the manifesto, and in it he said, this society is con committed to showing art which is decidedly debatable. That is what contemporary art is. Its purpose is to stir debate. Its purpose is to be the thing about which we do not agree. So the site of site-specific art is, at very least in most cases, also a site of disagreement. It is a social space not unlike street corners where people argue, or speakers' corners where people uh, make speeches, but there's a cacophony of speeches representing different points of view. The notion that what you do is create art to bring people together in order to have the same opinion is, in fact, a very antiquated and top-down and power-determined notion. The other notion is a notion actually much more in keeping with American traditions, or at least the traditions that I understand to be essential to us, which are more or less the traditions of uh, Walt Whitman and others who believed that we were a diverse multitude and that we could recognize each other because we were all different. Not because we were all the same, but because we were all different. It's what we had uh, in common was those differences and that we could imagine each other as other and we could imagine ourselves as other as a part of our definition of being an immigrant country, of being a country with native peoples, of being a country with every kind of class and every kind of uh, gender and sexuality. That was the Whitman's America of the leaves of grass, at least is, is important to me as any founding document in this country. And if you think of the social space of sculpture, it is essentially a social space of an urban environment usually, but not always, in which this takes place and what sculptors do under these circumstances or those people who program public sculpture do is to create Whitman-esque nodules where people can come together to disagree in a civil manner, in a thoughtful manner, where they can raise the level of discourse higher than it is in most circumstances. So this, for example, here's a piece about the seven virtues and seven vices from one of the most radical artists uh, now working in America, has worked in America for generations. Now, it is also cited in the middle of a university. Now, who can argue with virtues and vices? Uh, you can argue about who lives according to them, how one feels about them. You can do what Bruce basically does, is to conflate them in such a way that the certainties we may have about them become less certain in that they're bonded. But in any case, you can't claim that this is a provocative piece by virtue of advocating an extreme position. It simply risk, lists the available possibilities within the old order of morality. And this is cited in the middle of a campus where it shifts the conversation away from the analysis of the sciences, from the theories of a various and sundry social sciences, even from aesthetics theories and so on, to the oldest possible kind of uh, thoughts about ethics. And to put a piece about ethics in the middle of a university right now is a very interesting thing to have done because it sort of pushes aside a lot of what 
uh, we argue about in universities in the direction of arguing about some fundamentals without taking a position on those fundamentals, only presenting them as a question, about, a question mark about whether we take them any longer to be fundamentals. And then, of course, it's in the middle of a campus in the middle of Southern California in a generally conservative part of the country. So that many of the people outside the immediate confines of the university would have no trouble whatsoever with these virtues and vices, although they would be very, very concerned about where one fell on the sin scale or the virtue scale. Now, that's interesting, too, because that creates a social space where actually looking at these words is not in the least offensive to people outside the university. In fact, in some ways, it raises the very questions which they think about all the time in their various and sundry different uh, attitudes towards religion and politics and so on and so forth. And it puts them in common space between the university and the people uh, outside the university or who sometimes move through the university or who produce children that go to the university. So suddenly you have this very simple uh, proposition, which is not simple at all, because what it does is it creates precisely a matrix, a matrix of viewers considering a matrix of values that are up for debate. And it does it at nighttime. Nice, beautiful. Now, you know, where, where, does, where do we put fortitude and anger? Um, uh, this is nice also. This is Michael Asher's wonderful juxtaposition with the American flag of a very useful public fountain, which I gather people use now almost as a kind of good luck charm, um, which I think is only. And this is another case rather similar to uh, Nauman's, which is Jenny Holzer, an artist that Nauman actually uh, very much respects, who has also created a working space in which, if you look down, Fundamental questions, when the oppressed become, for example, is something you can read here, uh, fundamental questions of ethics, politics, of psychology, of the relation of the two uh, sexes or genders, uh, and many other things, just there so that if you come to put your coffee down to make notes and so on, suddenly something perhaps uh, more profound than you are dealing with uh, rises up to meet you. Or this is the top of Alexis Smith's uh, Serpent, is this the Garden of Eden? I believe it is. Uh, this is where you may stop and look and read a bench. And again, the correlations between Jenny Holzer and Alexis Smith are very interesting here. And this works down to Paradise Lost. Is that Paradise Lost, isn't it? Uh, and this approach so that you, and I love this piece because actually the way in which it's done, I, mean, I, I worry a lot about public art because I've done projects with a lot of uh, public artists and I was just talking to Mary about this. I mean, nowadays to have built a rolling sidewalk like this would be almost impossible. The insurance executives would go out of their minds. <laughs> Um, I gather the skateboards do go out of their minds, but in any case, to have done a project as complicated as this uh, and have gotten it past all of the possible uh, breakpoints that would any, that, that encounter anybody engaged in public art is really a sort of a, a miracle of diplomacy of which Mary is a great past master. But the other part of it is it's fundamental to its meaning because the sense that you're on this roller coaster of a serpent moving through the garden of the campus becomes as fundamental as anything you read or see or any symbolism that might be there. It's just the physical relationship to this thing that does this as you try to navigate the path. This is Elizabeth Murray, one of my uh, artists I worked with a great deal in one of my favorite pieces here, uh, Old Mother Hubbard's Shoe, as you've never seen it before or since. Here's John's piece, Read, Write, Think, and Dream. And here's Barbara Kruger's piece, which I think is wonderful, and it does many, many things, but not least of them are these texts, where you have these wonderful epigraphic texts on the floor. So if you come here to have a coffee or whatever it is, you look down and you will read a variety of things. And you don't just read the normal sort of edifying things that you might find uh, in other contexts in public buildings. You read disturbing things. You read things about one we, things that we may not agree with, said by people one may not necessarily identify with. And, and the variety goes from Emily Bronte to Franz Fanon. That's a pretty big variety. Uh, and so as you move through this, there are, there are prompts, provoc provocations, not of a sort of, a, of, a, of a, an aggressive nature, but simply things that will click switches in people's brains. So that the activity of reading is no longer a textbook thing. It is no longer a thing driven towards a particular result, a grade, an exam, a test. It is the activity of having little epiphanies, little challenges to whatever you're thinking about on a particular day in a particular way. And Barbara has very carefully chosen these texts because they will have that effect and indeed raise that as an issue explicitly in her selection.
by the way, the give your brain as much attention as you do your hair and you'll be a thousand times better is not what you may think it is, it's Malcolm X. Okay? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, and then education is the ability to listen to almost anything without losing your temper or your self-confidence. Uh, that's something I wish could be written in the Senate. As I say, this is an exemplary correction because it is, has been put together so carefully over such a period of time. And it's also been a model for what the collaboration of public and private sectors can actually do. Most of the debates seem to happen when it's only public money that's spent. Uh, and then when you introduce private money, there raises another issue of, is this an elite imposing its taste on us, the people? Now, who is us, the people, frankly? Uh, the debates about public art are debates about who owns the space, who has a right to control its content, etc. But there is no way to settle that debate to the satisfaction of all the people who will raise those objections. Uh, and as I tried to demonstrate with the example of Chicago's Picasso, the initial response to a great deal of art that people who later come to love is rejection. Uh, often in the case of uh, sort of museum type art, uh, you see people saying, well, for example, if you take Barbara Krug's example, uh, how can you possibly be interested in art that is just a text? Is that really art? Is that serious? Particularly just texts that say things like that. This is not like the kind of art that we like. This is not like Miro and Matisse and Picasso and so on, right? Uh, this was actually said by Morley Safer on CBS News. Um, so it's not just, again, people of uh, completely uh, undeveloped sensibilities, people who know better. Uh, but then, of course, uh, how many words would you find in Picasso? Or how many words would you find in Miro? What happens is that people reject modern art when it's new to them. They come to terms with it by arguing with it. Having come to terms with it and then argued with it, they internalize it. Having internalized it, they become to love it. And having come to love it, they use it as a bludgeon to beat up the next thing that disturbs them. Um, so uh, if you uh, don't like Barbara Kruger because there are words in it, you pick an artist who used words to tell people why Barbara Kruger is no good. Uh, very shortly, I trust, people will say, I don't like this new art by so-and-so, but I love Jenny Holzer, I love Barbara Kruger, I love uh, Bruce Nauman. And so it goes. One can't be too uh, uh, quick to respond to the challenge. You have to count on the power of the art, in fact, to permeate and have an effect on people over time, and that in time, they in fact come round to it and become very protective of it. And again, the, the, the physical situation here at the campus uh, is a special one, but if people were so disturbed by this art, it would be defaced, and it has not been so far as I know. It's amazing that all these things are intact. And I will just give you an urban environment corollary to this. Keith Haring made uh, public, sculpture, public murals all over the city of New York. And although there are a thousand graffiti writers out there to deface it, almost none of his pictures have ever been touched. Because people respected Keith, they respected what he did, and they weren't about to go and deface something that, in fact, they looked up to. Here's Barbara. Here's the Doho Sioux. This is the, uh, I call it the little house on the prairie, but it isn't a prairie. And this is the little house on the precipice. And this is where it soon will be, looking over the central courtyard. Now I'm going to throw some other things in. If the collection here at UCSD uh, can do what it has done in this kind of an environment, it also gives hope for others. Uh, for years I have worked with something called FAPE, which is a horrible acronym for Friends of Art, for Friends of Art and Preservation in Embassies, uh, which is a public-private group that pays to locate works of contemporary art in government buildings used for diplomacy. Now this is the beginning or the entrance to the new United uh, States UN delegation building in New York, which has just gone up, designed by Charles Gwathney. It's his last building. Uh, and it is a building where people come to discuss uh, foreign policy, to make negotiations on trade issues, to do all the things that go on. It is a building built for differences and discussion. That's what it's for. Um, and rather than simply put things in it, that would celebrate so-called agreed upon values, it is full of things that represent distinctive experiences, such that the first thing you see, even before you get to the security barrier, which is just around the corner on the right, is a piece by Carrie Mae Weems, uh, images of African-American children, and then simple color patches representing uh, the idea of color separated from the idea of race. Here in the elevator bank, once you've gotten into the inner sanctum on the ground floor, uh, is a work by Odili Danilo Dita, who is a Nigerian-American artist 
who has taken some of the ideas behind in the belly painting, who has taken some of the uh, prompts or the uh, precedents set by early uh, minimalist art and developed a whole new uh, kind of mural work for this occasion. And so everybody who comes to negotiate with the American ambassador uh, in this building passes immediately uh, through two works, one of them abstract, one of them semi-abstract, uh, in this idiom to think about America not as just the sum of its sort of patriotic symbols, but simply as a place of manyness, if you want to call it that. And this is the top of the same building. In between, there are 18 floors of art of all different kinds, including works by Ilya Kabakov, uh, Joel Shapiro, uh, more Carey May Weems, uh, and so on. But this is the top, and this is a, a big dome, central sort of cylinder, uh, the last thing that Solowit authorized to be made uh, before his death. Uh, on the far side is Linda Benglis, and then on the near side is Ron Gorchov. This is the public room for diplomacy and for d diplomatic receptions at the top of this building. And it is indeed abstract, and it is indeed ravishingly beautiful, and it is non-controversial, but it is not passively so. It is actually quite challenging this in terms of the aesthetic of many of the people who work here and in terms of the expectations of many of the people who come here. It's an example of how abstract art can, under certain circumstances, also raise, raise issues. Austere abstract art can also raise issues that will make people think differently about what it is that the United States is all about. Here is another piece that Solowit uh, uh, made available to the uh, embassies. This is in Berlin. Now, I'm putting this here because uh, they represent something else that one has to think seriously about in relation to public art. Um, I've talked about the uh, money used by government to do this. I've talked about the generosity of individual patrons. But one must also consider the generosity of artists. There's almost not a single work of public art for which an artist was paid even a percentage of what it is actually worth had they spent the time and effort on something for the market. Almost all of these uh, projects end up costing artists money or being break even or barely beyond break even. The decision by artists to do public art cannot be underestimated in terms of their desire to do something in the public domain and actually to reach out. In a society where we're being told over and over and over again by people who would like to organize, if you will, hostility towards the art, that artists essentially don't care, that they are playing hard to get, that they're mostly about business, and so on and so forth. Public art and the people who do most of it or much of it is a very good example of where artists have actually reversed that uh, trend almost entirely. And when we think of the list of artists who do this kind of work, we should think most of them are engaged in some kind of actual public discourse with the public about something that matters to them, not least the public itself. And now I'm going to end with this, and then uh, I'll end with this. This is a sort of um, complicated story. Uh, it's on par, in a way, with the kind of controversies which uh, I began with. This is Rachel White Reed's memorial uh, for uh, the victims of the Holocaust in Austria that was presented uh, a number of years ago in a competition that was voted on by the jury of the competition, which was created by Simon Wiesenthal, uh, and which was eventually erected. But eventually, that is to say, after years of sitting in limbo. The project was invented by uh, Wiesenthal, more or less, to overcome the fact that a memorial to Holocaust victims had been uh, voted for in Austria and then had been erected without any mention of the fact that they were Jewish. Uh, and so basically you had Austria hiding from the fact that it had persecuted uh, 65,000 or killed 65,000 Jews uh, during the Nazi period and trying to make it a monument to the victims of fascism sort of generically. And Wiesenthal quite rightly objected to this and worked hard to organize the making of a proper memorial to the Jewish community of uh, Vienna particularly, but also of uh, Austria altogether. Um, and this was a very bitter controversy, and it was also a very loaded site. Where this is cited is something called the Judenplatz, which is actually the heart of the old Jewish ghetto, the medieval Jewish ghetto. Uh, and in this particular place, uh, terrible things had happened. Actually, the memorial is cited right next to what used to be the medieval synagogue. Uh, in the uh, 15th century. And that synagogue was burned down by a Christian mob with almost the entire Jewish community of the time in it. So it was a doubly hallowed site with the victims of one Holocaust and of another. And in the wall opposite, 
there is a Christian, uh, um, how do you say, a niche, uh, and it shows the baptism of Christ, and it says in Old German, and as Christ was, ble was washed by the water, so Vienna was washed of the Jews by fire. So the, there is an an a medieval anti-Semitic sign looking down on this site. Uh, it was an incredibly loaded situation, and it was an incredibly contentious situation, and it was the biggest hot potato that you could imagine. And it is a testament to Wiesenthal, who was, uh, as most people know, an absolutely uh, incredibly uh, uh, sort of um, tough-minded man, that he pushed through the doing of this. Now, as it happened, uh, the voting for this was done under a socialist government because uh, Austria has split between a conservative national government and a socialist uh, uh, urban government of Vienna for many, many years. During the course of this monument's development, it flipped. It became a socialist national government and a conservative local government. Uh, and so uh, all of these uh, political variables played into the fact that this thing was voted on, uh, was approved by the city, uh, was funded, and then was not built. Now, uh, the story of how this got built, again, is an interesting long uh, story, but one episode I will give you as a kind of metaphor for what I'm trying to say more generally. Um, at a certain point, I, went, I was on the jury, and I went back to Vienna to see if I could untangle the mess. Uh, that I'm a Gentile was a problem because I couldn't speak from the Jewish community. That I was an American was a problem because I was an American. I was meddling in foreign affairs. There were all kinds of ways in which stereotypical uh, applications of people or descriptions of people made it difficult. But in the course of things, it became apparent that the conservative government which had inherited this monument as a project uh, was almost prepared to do it uh, and then balked. And it was looking for a way in or a way out. And part of my mission was to negotiate among the different parties involved. Uh, and uh, in one particular case, we went to the head of the Jewish community at that time, a Dr. Gross, a wonderful 80-plus-year-old man, a Holocaust survivor himself, and the conservative member of the government who was charged with solving this problem went to him and said, listen, we will build it if only the Jews will tell us that they want it. And Dr. Gross said, but I'm not going to tell you that. If you want to atone for what has been done to us, you have to want it. And then uh, the younger rabbi, who was his uh, sort of aide-de-camp and second, he said, but in any case, you understand that no matter what you build, the monument is not in the monument that you make. The monument is in the conversation that floats above it. And in a basic way, that is true of all public art. What you do when you're in public domain is to create an intersection where people come together, where a specific thing is the occasion for conversations, and the thing that precipitates that conversation is very important in setting the quality of that conversation, but what it matters, what is public, what is living and ongoing is the thing above. So with that, I'll leave it.